Our subject for today, dressed for the occasion. What did I say? Dress for the occasion. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's god is good that's weak god is good and all the time happy sabbath everyone if you love god say amen god heard it and god is pleased i am grateful to god for this high honor of speaking for him i will do the best i can within my limited capacity to deliver Thus saith the Lord. That alone will change your lives. My opinions have absolutely no value. So I will keep them jealously to myself. Is there anyone among us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? Anyone among us? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? May I see anyone who has made a decision to be baptized? May I see your hand? Ah, I like you. And you. And you, I like you too. And you, and you, I'm liking a lot of people. It is the most intelligent decision you can make, which goes along with a decision to give your life to Jesus Christ. And there are two good reasons to give your life to Christ. One, you live with him when he comes, you escape the horrors of hell. Two, your life really belongs to him. To refuse to give the life to Christ is to practice theft. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. I am not speaking from the book of Revelation. I am speaking literally, your life belongs to God. To withhold it from God is to steal. And the Bible says, as you just heard, thou shalt not steal. And so even before I get into the message, stop stealing from God and give him your life. All honest people say amen. There are few of you who are not, but I understand. I uh, welcome our family 
at Born Again and our family at Missouri City, wherever you are, God bless you. It is a tremendous honor to be a member of the family of God. The church on earth and the church in heaven are one. Is this mic working? <laughs> the church on earth and the church in heaven, come on, are one. Mm -hmm. You know what Jesus said to Mary, go and tell Peter, I ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. The God of Jesus, the Father of Jesus, is our Father. And so Jesus told us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, come on, say it, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. How? As it is in heaven. Because heaven and earth must be one. Our subject for today, dressed for the occasion. What did I say? dress for the occasion before i get into that let me ask you first to preserve reverence wherever you are god loves reverence and he rewards those who practice reverence and i'm not referring to that accident so please think i am i am not accidents happen in an imperfect world but go on sin no more a uh, favor number two i want you to pray for me while i'm speaking all i want you to say is lord put your words in that man's mouth that is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. That's the divine and the human. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I, divine, have put my words divine in thy mouth, human. And I want God's words placed in my mouth. And in favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. Don't just sit with an open brain and allow me to pour things into your head think filter and your filter is thus saith the lord isaiah 118 come now let us reason together saith the lord let's pray our father in heaven we come into your presence for the single purpose of worshiping you the god of heaven and earth we thank you for your love dear god your love for us is so stubborn we thank you for it Forgive us where we have offended you, Father. We did not mean to. Christ died that we might be forgiven. Grant us that forgiveness now, we pray. We place our sin with righteousness, Father. As we embark on this portion of the service, grant us your spirit, dear God, to continue supervising what we do. Speak through me, dear God, that the words I speak may be words from the throne of glory, the throne of grace, the throne of truth. Father, bless all those listening in person via in electronic connection. If there are visitors connecting, dear God, wherever they are, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus. Grant them a special blessing. There may be little boys and little girls listening. Father, Jesus was at one point a little boy. Bless them because they too can understand much more than we suspect. I humble myself before you, dear God. I am a carnal person. I am flesh. I am dirt. I am clay. I am of the earth. But I love to speak for you. Suppress my carnal nature. Take it by the throat and choke it into submission, dear God, that your glory becomes my only business. Bless every country represented by the listening audience. Teach the leaders, dear God, that righteousness exalteth the nation and also exalts the individual who practices righteousness. Heal anyone listening who has the COVID-19, Father. Deliver that person or those persons from that horrible affliction. Restore them to health and let them, chew, let them receive that expression of goodness as, Father, a reason for them to come closer to you. Bless this country of the United States. Guide the decisions of the leaders that their decisions may allow the gospel to go forward. Keep us faithful, dear God. Save us when you come without losing one. I pray in Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? Dress for the occasion. A little slow. Dressed for the occasion. Your Adventist, you ought to be fast. Dress for the occasion. Go with me to Second Peter, chapter 3. Quickly. We used to be called the people of the book. Notice I said we used to be called the people of the book. We need to get that title back. Second Peter 3, let's read from verse 9. 
verse 9 of 2 Peter 3. Not verse 9, sorry, verse 10. Do you have that? But the day of the Lord, I read from the King James Version, you may feel free to read with me. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be what? Dissolve what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, let me hear a chorus of voices reading verse 13. Come on. Nevertheless, come on. We, according to his promise, look for what? New heavens, come on, and new earth. Finish the first wherein dwelleth righteousness there are some churches where all members dress the same way i frequently go to south africa there are some churches they meet under trees and all the people wear white of course you can't try that in this church but all the people wear white so no one has to compare with the other there are no fashion problems they all wear men and women in white in the army, there are no fashion problems. They all dress the same way. But I'm, I said that to say this. Dress can identify you. Did I speak error or did I speak truth? Dress can identify you. Now, the Bible says we are headed for the world and the heavens wherein dwelleth righteousness. The lifestyle is all righteousness. Go to Revelation 19. Ten minutes to twelve. I have to speak at one o'clock for a church in New York. But I won't rush. If you find the passages quickly. What book did I say? Revelation, what chapter? 19, let's read from verse 7. Are you there? Read with me. What does it say? Let us rejoice, come on, and be glad and give honor to why for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready verse 8 and to her was what granted that she should be what arrayed in fine linen clean and white finish the verse for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saint in that verse righteousness is symbolized how as a garment go to revelation 16. Our subject, dress for the occasion. Let's read verse 15, nice and loud. What does it say? Behold, I come how? As a thief. Keep reading. Blessed is he that what? Watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Here again, we see righteousness symbolized as a garment. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation, the book where all other books find their fulfillment. And I said, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, there will be a change, a reformation, a revival among God's people. Revelation, what chapter did I say? What verse? 18. Are you there? Read with me. What does that say? I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich keep reading carefully now and a white raiment come on that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear here again we have righteousness symbolized as a garment now we are headed for a new world where the lifestyle is what righteousness then how should we dress righteousness should be our garment Let's add to that. Let us go to Acts 17. Acts 17. The book of Acts, written by whom? Uh, that's a good guess, but I have to flunk you. Luke. Luke, yeah. Luke wrote two books. What are the two books? Luke and Acts. Yes, okay. What book did I say? Acts, what chapter? 17, what verse? 31. Read for me, what does that say? 
because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world how in righteousness come on by that man whom he hath okay now that's fine he will judge the world someday in righteousness it makes sense that the world is judged in righteousness if we are preparing to enter what new world wherein dwelleth righteousness god is consistent let us go to second timothy chapter four our subject dress for the occasion second timothy chapter four who wrote that book paul yes god bless you second timothy four we'll read seven and eight and god bless you for bringing your bibles and for loving the truth i really mean that sincerely read with me i have fought a good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith stop don't answer me i'm about to ask you a question are you fighting a good fight there are some people who expect god to just change them with no effort from them i have fought a good fight first timothy chapter 6 verse 12 paul tells timothy fight the good fight of faith the half brother of jesus christ james in james chapter 4 verse 7 he says submit yourself therefore to god resist this is not lie down and god save me there must be an effort jesus says come unto me the bible says if he confess let's go back to second timothy chapter 4 7 and 8 i have fought a good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith read verse 8 clearly henceforth there's notice notice henceforth henceforth because of this my faithfulness to god by the power of christ there's laid up for me there's a connection between that crown of righteousness and the life you live now you cannot save yourself you cannot mass produce righteousness but there is a connection between the life we live and whether or not we are admitted to that righteous new world henceforth verse 8 read with me there is laid up for me what a crown of righteous stop describe the world that god has provided for us it's a righteous world tell me about the judgment that will decide who enters that world it's in righteousness tell me about the crown that we shall receive it's a righteous crown now let's read it again henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge how do you describe the judge of that judgment he's righteous then what do we need above anything else come on what the righteousness what's the central teaching of the bible righteousness by faith what god does for us and in us through jesus christ righteousness by faith and so we're looking for let me pray again father continue to be with me help me to be patient with your people bless us lord i pray be glorified and bless us in jesus name i pray amen a righteous new world a righteous judgment a righteous judge a righteous crown the central teaching of the bible righteousness but what is righteousness go to jeremiah chapter 23 Jeremiah 23, we'll read verses 5 and 6. We're trying to answer the question, what is righteousness? Do you have Jeremiah 23? 5 and 6. Can we read now? If you have my version, you may read with me. What does that say? Behold, the days come said the lord that i will raise unto whom david a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth verse 6 keep reading in his days judah shall be saved and israel shall dwell 
safely finish the verse and this is his name whereby he shall be called come on the lord our righteousness question for you what is righteousness jesus so i should have said who is righteousness the foundational definition of righteousness is jesus but when jesus made us by the way it was jesus who made us well who made adam and eve can someone give Jesus credit and say amen? amen? What am I doing wrong? Nobody says anything. It was Christ who said, let there be light. It was Jesus who said, let there be a firmament. And the Father himself in Hebrews 10 tells the Son, but thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Do you understand that the man who said on the cross, it is finished, is the one who said, let there be light? He is righteousness. When he said in Genesis 1 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We were to be like him then, we are to be like him now. If he's righteousness, we are to reflect that righteousness. Jesus Christ is righteousness. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Our subject, dress for the occasion. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we we'll read verse 30. First Corinthians, written by whom? Paul, yes. Paul wrote about one quarter of the New Testament. Luke's two books make up one, another quarter of the New Testament. First Corinthians 1, reading verse 30. When you find that, say amen. amen. What does that say? Read for me. What does it say? But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, come on, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that verse says jesus is our wisdom jesus is our redemption or righteousness jesus is our sanctification and our righteousness listen to jesus i am the way i am the truth i am the life which is slightly different from i have a way and i have a truth and i have life no I am truth. I am the way. I am life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. That's why he was the great I am, or he is, when he told Moses, go and say to the Israelites, I am, have sent me unto you. I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is wisdom. Jesus is is righteousness jesus is sanctification jesus is redemption meaning there is no righteousness outside of christ there is no wisdom that heaven uh, approves outside of jesus christ there is no redemption outside of christ there is no righteousness outside of christ he is our righteousness so when you have christ dwelling in you righteousness dwells in you so Christ, but let's look at righteousness again. What is righteousness? Let us go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's read verse 25. Our subject, dressed for the occasion. Deuteronomy 6, reading verse 25. Who wrote Deuteronomy? Moses. Well, he wrote most of it. The chapter about his death, he couldn't write. Deuteronomy 6. Let's read verse 25. Let me pray. Dear God, remind me that I am here for your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Deuteronomy 6.25, are you there? Read with me. What does it say? And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do what? All these commandments, come on. Before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Then righteousness is associated with God's commandments. The back, go to Matthew 20, not 20, Matthew 12. Quickly. Matthew 12. Let's read verse 34. I want you to read microscopically. Concentrate as you read. Matthew 12, 
Reading verse 34. Do you have that? Read with me. What does it say? O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Finish the verse. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What comes out of the mouth originates where? In the heart. For us and for God. The Zara of Ages, page 19, paragraph 2, Ella White writes, The law which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. The love, I should say, which seeketh not his, her own has its source in the heart of God. Now, when the voice said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, from where did that come? The heart of God. What did Jesus say in Matthew 12, 34? Out of the air? Uh, mm -hmm, the heart speaking. The mouth speaking. When that voice said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, what was the origin of those words? Come on, tell me. The heart of God. Then from where did the commandments come? The heart of God. Now the Bible says this is the whole duty of man. Please think. The whole duty of man is to express the heart of God. But since we're limited, it is expressed in Ten Commandments. Are you following me? Now Jesus says the commandments are love to God, love to your fellow man. The Holy Spirit told Moses to write, It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do how many of these commandments all. Then you may say, oh, then I can save myself. Let me obey. Listen to Jesus. We must study here a little. There a little. Without me, finish my words. You can do nothing. Particularly, keep those commandments. Yes, it shall be a righteousness if we observe to do. But how will we observe to do? Through the indwelling of Jesus Christ. Because actually, it is he that does it through us with our permission. This was how Jesus lived. Go to John 14. John 14, my second favorite book, John. Beautiful book, written by the disciple who was closest to Christ and of whom Ella White said he most perfectly reflected the character of Christ above all the other disciples. The one who leaned on Jesus' breast. He was so close that Peter said to him, you ask him who shall betray him. Never let someone tell, never ask someone to tell you what Jesus said. Ask Jesus yourself. Are you following me? You be so close that you ask him yourself. But Peter said, ask him. Peter could have asked himself. Anyway, let's get back to John 14. Let's read from verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that have seen me have seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not, keep reading with me now, that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Keep reading. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Come on. But the Father that dwelleth in me, finish the verse. Mm -hmm. That's how Jesus lived. Now here's how we should live. Galatians 2.20, don't go there, just say it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Keep reading. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As verily as Jesus was indwelt by the Father, and the Father worked through him, we are to be indwelt by Christ, that Christ may work through us. And when that's the case, the lives we live are righteous lives. And so Deuteronomy 6.25, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do. The word if introduces what? A condition. Mm -hmm. As much as God loves us, he will not save us contrary to our will. 
When he made Adam, he did not ask Adam, would you like to be made? He just made him. And we know what Adam did. Now God is asking us, do you want me to remake you? He gets our permission first before he puts us in that new world. He just made Adam, then said, do you want to stay? Adam said, no, <laughs> by virtue of his sin. Now, as I said, God is making us for, God is first seeking our permission, getting us right. Then he'll place us in that new world by our request. The father lived in Jesus in a mysterious way. And Christ must live in us the same mysterious way that we might live righteous lives. Our subject, dressed for the occasion. We're heading for a world where everyone wears what? A righteous character. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 looks like 10 after 12 or some such thing. Psalm 119. And my family at Born Again and Baytown, Laporte, I'm still with you. God bless you, and whoever is listening, wherever you are, New York, Kuala Lumpur, God bless you, God bless you. We're all one through the Spirit. Psalm 119, verse 172. I want you to read that clearly and loudly. Read with me. What does it say? My tongue, Psalm 119, verse 172. What does that say? My tongue shall speak of thy... Finish the verse. For all thy commandments are righteousness. In other words... It is righteous not to steal. That's one amen anymore. Amen. It is righteous to keep the Sabbath. Amen. Then what is it to not keep the Sabbath? Give me a smaller word. A smaller word. Sin. Because the opposite of righteousness is sin. If righteousness is the law, sin is the violation of the law. All thy commandments are righteousness. The only way to live a righteous life in the eyes of God. Now you may live a righteous life in the eyes of the government and they'll give you a medal. And you wear that medal to hell. To live a righteous life in the eyes of God, that life may be consistent, must be consistent with God's commandments. But only by the power of Christ. Whose very life is an expression of the commandments. Stay in Psalm 119. Let's go to Psalm 1, verse 142. Psalm 119, verse 142. Are you there? What does that say? Thy righteousness, come on, is an everlasting righteousness. Come on. And thy law is the truth. What's the law? Give me another word for the law. The Ten Commandments. We're not saved by keeping the ceremonial law. We're saved by Jesus. But Christ calls us to live by the Ten Commandments. The Bible doesn't say the ceremonial law is the whole duty of man. The keeping of the commandments is the whole duty of man. So when you read, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, thy law is the truth. Righteousness and the law are virtually the same thing. Because the law, thy commandments are righteousness. Go to verse 144. Verse 144 of Psalm 119. Do you have that? Read with me. Come on. The righteousness of thy testimonies is... Stop. Read verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. 144 says, the righteousness of thy testimony is everlasting. It's precisely the same thing because the testimonies refer to the commandments. Go to Exodus 31. You look at me strangely. Exodus 31. God is good. And all the time. May I say that you look like very nice people. You really do. Did I speak the truth? Say amen. <laughs> okay. What book did I say? Exodus, what chapter? 31, reading verse 18. When you found it, say amen. If you're still looking, say amen. All right, read with me. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, come on, two tables of 
testimony, keep reading, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now, what are the two tables of testimony? The Ten Commandments. Why testimony? What is a testimony? It's what a witness gives. Are you with me? You give your testimony. You say what you know. The law express the character of God. They are witness to the character of God. Otherwise, it says God is as sacred as his law, or the law is as sacred as God himself. They are a testimony of the unselfish character of God. That's what they call test. The ark is called the ark of the testimony. Because the purpose of the ark was to carry the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the entire tabernacle was the Ten Commandments. Let me pray. Father, as I enter this phase, give me the right word, dear God, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me carefully. Reason with me. This side. When you entered, when, you, when a sinner brought his animal to the priest, what's the first section of the tabernacle he entered? The outer court. Was that holy, yes or no? Yes. When the killing was done, the blood was collected. Sometimes the priest took the blood and went where? To the holy place. Was that holy? Was it holier than the outer court? Is the outer court called holy? Yes. Is the outer court called holy? No, but was it holy? Yes. Now was the holy place holy? Yes. Between the holy place and the outer court, which was holier? The holy place. Now, where did the priest go once a year? The most holy. Was it holier than the holy? Yes. Was it holier than the outer court? Yes. So we have degrees of holiness, yes or no? Come on, say it with confidence. Yes or no? Yes, we have degrees of holiness. The sinner could come to the outer court. He could not enter the holy place. The Levites could enter the holy place. They could not enter the most holy. We have degrees of holiness now. You tell me, where was the altar of sacrifice? Come on, where was the altar of sacrifice? In the outer court. Where was the laver? In the outer court. Is this an Adventist church? It is. Hey, Father. Where was the candlestick? Quickly. Where was the, the bread? The uh, altar of incense? Yes. Now, all these things are highly significant. Am I right? The altar represented what? Calvary. The lever, the washing of the word and the spirit. The candlestick, the light. The bread, the word. All the Vincent's, the intercession of Christ, those are absolutely essential, but they were not in the most holy place. What really is the main article in the most holy place? The ark. But what is the function of the ark? To house the Ten Commandments. Now you tell me, reason with me. Could God have put the Ten Commandments in the outer court? You can do anything you want. Let me ask you again and so redeem yourselves. Could God have put the law in the outer court? Yes, because he's God. You don't want to see me angry. <laughs> Come on, you Adventists. Could God have put the law in the holy place? Where did he put it? In the most holy. Now you tell me, what does that mean? God, the character of God, the essence of God righteousness as expressed in the law or the law of love in the most holy place when the priest entered the most holy place all sins had to be forgiven if he entered the most holy with one sin in his life you tell me the unpleasant details drop dead the garments of the priest on the hem there were bells hmm? Now, Jewish tradition tells us a rope was tied around his waist, and it extended right out of the tabernacle. Now, as he moved, ministering, what did they hear? The bells. When the bells stopped ringing, <laughs> you know what happened. He was dead, but you couldn't go get him unless you wanted to join him in death. What did they do? They used the rope to pull him out. The most holy place and the thing in that place was the law. Eloise says the ark was merely a receptacle 
for the, the, the precepts. It was the presence of these precepts that gave to the ark its sacredness and importance. Otherwise, it was just wood. It was the presence of the Ten Commandments that made the ark untouchable. You ask Uzzah if you don't believe me. You know who Uzzah was? All right. That law expressed righteousness. Now the Bible says, nevertheless, we according to his promise. And what God promises, he keeps if we fulfill the conditions. Look for new heavens, new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Go to Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. Let's read verse 18. Isaiah 48, very beautiful book. By the way, Isaiah, more than any other Old Testament book, talks about Jesus. That's why he's called the gospel prophet. You have Isaiah 48, verse 18. Let me pray, Father in heaven, continue to be with me, dear God. Please, I pray from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Read with me. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my what? Stop. How do you, what do you think the prophet is feeling when he said, Oh, that thou hadst hearkened unto? What do you think he's feeling? What does it sound like? Is he speaking calmly? Is, is it a crisis? Is he broken up? Is he distressed? Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Hmm? Keep reading. Then had thy peace been what? As a river. Keep reading. And thy righteousness. As the waves of the sea. Now, the prophet is attaching peace and righteousness to what? Hearkening to the commandments of God. If you want peace of mind, obey God. Ministry of Healing, page 480, paragraph 3. 480, paragraph 3. Many who profess to be Christ's followers have an anxious, troubled heart. Because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to him, for they shrink from the consequences that such a surrender it may involve. Unless they make this surrender, they cannot have peace. And so Isaiah says, O oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then hath thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, the consciousness of right doing, not the Bible, L -O -Y, is the best medicine for disease, bodies, and minds. He that is at peace with God has secured the most important requisite to health. Health for living, page 233, paragraph 7. Listen again. The consciousness of right doing. I know I'm trying to obey God. Try not to offend him by his grace. The consciousness of right doing is the best medicine for diseased bodies and minds. He that is at peace with God because he tries to obey God has secured the most important requisite to health. Now, I listen to many Adventist presentations on health and they give the eight health laws and call them new start and whatever else. But no one ever says confess your sins. The number one health law is confess your sins. Because sin is the source of sickness. I don't mean to digress, but sin is the source of sickness. Whether sins you commit or simply living in a sinful world. Remove sin, sickness goes, death goes, wars go, prisons, jails, divorce, everything goes. And God desires for us not sin, but righteousness. Now, it's uh, 20 after... 12. Can I have 15 more minutes? Say yes. All right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, continue to be with me, I pray. I beg you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go to Romans 5. Romans 5. And after that, we'll jump over to Genesis 2 and 3. And I preach on those passages more than any other, I suspect, because some people just don't get it. Romans 5, we're looking at verse 19. 
Do you have that? I want just the men to read. If the men have my version. Men, do you have my version? King James. All right. Read with me, men. You're the leaders. Strong voices. For as by one man's disobedience. Come on. Many were made sinners. Keep reading. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Stop. How many men are in that verse? How many times do you see the word man or one? Twice. Who are the men? Adam, come on. And Jesus, the second Adam. The Bible says, as by one man's disobedience. Based on all we've said, give me an intelligent definition of disobedience. Yeah, that's true, but I want another word put in there. What is disobedience? Yes, you're right, but uh, based on all I've said, Unrighteous. unrighteousness. I like that man, handsome man, reminds me of myself. Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. For as by one man's unrighteousness, and we can see that by reading verse 18. Now, ladies, you read verse 18. Are you there? Read for me, ladies. What does that say? Therefore, as by what? No, start again. Therefore, as by the offense, come on, of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Go on. Ah, by the right. So we have in verse 18, offense and righteousness as opposites. We have in 19, obedience and disobedience. Those two verses are saying what? The same thing. But look at the words. In verse 18, we have offense. Do you see it? What's the equivalent to offense in verse 19? Ah, sister, God bless you. Disobedience. Do we have in verse 18 righteousness? Come on, do you see that? What's the equivalent in 19? Obedience. Now what is righteousness? Obedience. What is sin? Disobedience. What world are we preparing for? A world of? Or a world of? A world of obedience to God. Where obedience is your genetic desire. Even as disobedience is our genetic desire now before we convert it. That's why we have to be born again. So we come into the world now with new spiritual genetic information. Which says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. This is the result of conversion, the new birth. And it can only be done by a divine power. Jesus tells us in John 3 verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Only a divine being can make that change. Sociology cannot. Psychology, therapy, mm -mm. they have their place. Don't misunderstand me, you therapists. The new birth can only be accomplished by a divine power because it requires the rewriting of genetic information at the spiritual level. So as verily as a sinner's urge is to sin, a converted person's urge is to do right. You look at me puzzled. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Listen to Ellen White. Mind, character, and personality, volume 2, page 601, paragraph 4. That which at first seems difficult, by constant repetition grows easy, and right thoughts and actions become habitual. I am saying to you, as truly... As a carnal person naturally prefers sin, the converted person learns to prefer righteousness and will die rather than sin. What's our subject? Dressed for the occasion. What is the dress we should all wear? Righteousness. Go to ne not Nehemiah, Zechariah chapter 3. I'm coming to the end. It's 25. Well, I'll take five more minutes. You gave me 15. We have a few left. Zechariah chapter 3. We read from verse 1. Our subject, dress for the occasion. A 
And by the way, baptism is an act of righteousness. I hope the Spirit reminds me to get into that briefly. Baptism is an act of righteousness. When the minister baptizes you, that is an act of righteousness. Zechariah 3, reading from verse 1, Father in heaven, continue to be with me, please God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Read with me. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing where? At his right hand to resist him. By the way, every day, that's the devil's work. Resist, resist, oppose, make your life miserable. Christ is there to give us power and power and power. Right hand to resist him. And verse 2, what does that say? And the Lord said, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Whether the fire is drugs, alcohol, financial mismanagement, God can pluck you out of that fire. Verse 3, now read carefully. Now Joshua was clothed, how? Filthy garments. Representing what? Quickly. Sin. And stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, What? Take away the filthy garments from him. Mm -hmm. And unto him he said, What? Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. I will do that. That's God. I will remove, and I will pay it. Put on you the same way God removed the aprons and put on the coats of skins. And that new garment is righteousness. That old garment, sin. But God puts it not on our skins, he puts it on our hearts, you see. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, the hands act, the feet act. Everything proceeds, Ellen White writes, in Christ's Object Lessons, page 316, every act is judged by the motive. And motives come from here, not here. I will clothe thee with change of raiment. When Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized, John chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 3, John said, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou unto me? Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill, finish the words, all righteousness. Repentance is an act of righteousness. Confession is an act of righteousness. Baptism is an act of righteousness. If we're preparing for a righteous world, we must practice righteousness in this world. And righteousness in its condensed form is the Ten Commandments. And so the wisest man who ever lived who was an ancestor of Jesus Christ, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He writes when he was an old man now, he looks back over his life. Because old age has the virtue or the benefit of a rear view mirror, you see. You look back. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, no matter what. Fear God. Respect him. Give him reverence. And keep, if you don't fear God, you will not keep his commandments. Are you following me? So the keeping of the commandments express your reverence for God and your love. Fear God and keep his commandments for this, come on, tell me, is the whole duty of man. And what's the commandments? All thy commandments are righteousness Deuteronomy 6 25 it shall be a righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us the duty of the child of God is to live a righteous life but it can only be lived by the indwelling power of Christ because the righteousness is ultimately Jesus Christ himself dwelling in us and he speaks through us. He guides our thoughts. As we stay submitted like clay in the hands of the potter. Someone listening to me needs to practice righteousness by making a decision to be baptized. Or to be rebaptized. Because by your own assessment, your life has not been what it should be. And perhaps the Spirit of God has been convicting you. You need to start with God all over again. Evangelism, page 375. Rebaptism, reconversion must take place among the brethren. 
And she says, if a person is truly reconverted, let that person be rebaptized. Let him renew his covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with him. Some of us listening, wherever you are, need to make that decision, which is a righteous one, to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Because we're told in Galatians 3.27, those who are baptized have put on Christ. And we're talking about righteousness. I want you to make a decision to seek the power of Christ to live a righteous life. As you and I anticipate a righteous new world. But prior to the new world, we have a righteous judgment. It's based on the Ten Commandments. The judge presiding is a righteous judge. He appears on our heads, come on, a righteous crown. And we enter a world where everything is right. Angels obey. Human beings obey. Those in unfallen worlds obey. The entire universe will throb with one harmony of obedience to the creator. Righteousness. How many of you will say with me, Lord, I pray as David prayed, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Can I see your right hand? Stand with me. A clean heart is a righteous one because righteousness has no sin. Do we become saints overnight? No, I'm not saying that. We grow in grace, but your decision is 100%. You tell me when the mob puts a contract on you, the mafia, it may take 10 years to find you, but they'll find you because it is in the heart to carry out that contract that hit. If your decision is to live a righteous life by the power of Christ, that decision is what God looks at. Faith and Works, page 50, I believe it is 54. Ellen White writes, when it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth toward this end, God accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service. And he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine matter. He said, she tried. I'll make up for where she fell short. He tried. I will make up because God is more desperate to get you into heaven than we are to enter. But we must make that decision. When God told Abraham sacrifice Isaac, it was in his heart to do it. And the Bible writes as if it was actually done. Hebrews 11 verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. God accepted it as done because it was done here. Even though God stepped him physically, but he accepted it as done. If you make a decision with all your heart and soul to keep the Sabbath holy, God accepts that. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Dear God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, Father. He is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. We thank you for your commandments that express the righteousness of Christ, which is your righteousness. We thank you, dear God, you've made a way for us to live righteous lives by the indwelling of our Savior as verily as the human Jesus lived a righteous life by your indwelling of him. There are some people listening to me, dear God. They love you. They need to make the courageous and bold step to choose to be baptized, to make that decision because that is a righteous decision. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, wherever you are, whether here or in Born Again or Missouri City, or wherever you are around the world, if the Spirit of God has convicted you, make a decision where you are to be baptized. But for those in my presence, if there's someone who has not yet made a decision to be baptized, or to start with God all over again, and there are a variety of reasons, Father, why people may do that. Either they did it when they understood nothing. They did it and they drifted from you, Father. Or they did it under pressure. But if there's someone who needs to make a decision for God to be baptized or rebaptized, and you've not yet made it and you'll make it now, I want you to raise your right hand. You've not yet made it, you'll make it now. Raise your right hand. God bless you. God bless you, my brother. You've not yet made it to be rebaptized or baptized. Raise that hand. Who takes names? I see those two hands right here. I need someone to write these. We see a third hand off to the left. 
Someone come quickly. This is very serious. We must get the names. There's a, a daughter of God right here, a daughter of God back there, a son of God to my right. So we have two people, Pastor Sang, the brother right here, get his name, please. Whether it's for baptism, rebaptism, get the name. We have the sister right here, and we have the sister back there. Yes, sister back there, I believe in the red top. We need her name. Anyone else? If you're at uh, Missouri City, raise your hand, someone will take your name. If you're at Baytown Laporte, someone will take your name. And wherever you are around the globe, if you've been convicted, make a decision and find a Seventh-day Adventist church where you are and let the leaders know you have made the right decision to be baptized. And all of heaven will be pleased. Anyone else? A decision for baptism or rebaptism in Acts chapter 19, the first seven verses is the story of Paul rebaptizing 12 disciples. Anyone else? make one more appeal and it's for everyone listening to me wherever you are you've been visiting Adventist churches you've loved what you've heard and the spirit has been moving you in the direction of accepting this truth and you want to say father I need to learn just a little more before I decide if there's someone who will say I need some extra Bible studies before I make the decision for baptism wherever you are let that be known to the leaders of the churches where you are and they will arrange for you to get those studies because baptism must be an intelligent choice but do not wait until you know everything that's a trick of the devil if you know you want to obey god you know god wants to save you you have enough and you know god has a standard his law you know enough to make a decision to be baptized and now how many will say father Thank you for your love. I recommit my life to you. Can I see your hand? I recommit my life. Keep your hands up if it does not hurt. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, which is so persistent, dear God. Your love expressed in the death of your son. I pray from my heart, Father, if I said anything wrong, forgive me. If I misrepresented you, forgive me, Father. Bless every man, woman who raised a hand. They are recommitting their lives to you where their lives rightfully belong. Please, God, bless them individually. Bless them in the spirit of Steps to Christ, page 100, paragraph 1. The relations between God and each soul are as direct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Give them that individual attention, Father. Bless us. Keep us faithful. Give us a love for righteousness, dear God. And a hatred for sin. Because you describe Jesus in Hebrews 1.9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Give us that mind, I pray. Bless us for the remainder of this day. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen.